I'm Kyle Kittleson with Med Circle, joined today by Jill Wise, who's going to share her fascinating story being raised by a narcissist. To start, who are you and what is your role that you play in this current narcissism landscape? Sure. My name is Jill Wise, and I am a narcissistic abuse recovery coach. Um, narcissistic abuse is something that I unfortunately know a lot about as I was raised by a malignant narcissist and I was also married to a, a malignant narcissist. So I now devote my life to spreading awareness and helping other victims um, heal and recover from narcissistic abuse. When was the moment that you realized your father was a narcissist? Well, I always knew something was wrong. Um, mm. From a very young age, but I would the the moment that I the, all the pieces of the puzzle started to come together was uh, when my then fourteen year old child had come home from being uh, having a long stretch of exposure to his father and my own, and he came home with some uh, some of the same behaviors, and that's when I started digging into this and really. Uh, knew I had to find the answers. So it was around 2014. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you have a son, you are an adult, you've lived a lot of life before understanding what had been happening. What were the early years like being raised by a malignant narcissist? And if you wouldn't mind defining a malignant narcissist for our viewers who may not know who that is. Sure, sure. Well, malignant narcissism you know, narcissism is on a spectrum and malignant narcissism is at the top of the spectrum, which basically means, in my opinion, what makes them malignant is there is a pleasure that they gain in uh, abusing or humiliating other people. There's a sadistic element to the personality disorder. Um, and there is, they do um, tend to enjoy what they're doing to other people. And that, in my opinion, is what makes it malignant. What was it like being raised by him? Uh, oh boy, it was chaotic. It was chaotic, it was traumatizing. Um, and then it was filled with moments where I felt loved and um, cared for by my father. So it was confusing because there were, there were two sides to him. One was very loving and kind and generous and even funny. And then the other side was uh, abusive and cruel and rageful and um, terrorizing. Mm -hmm. So it was confusing childhood. Can you provide any stories or examples from your childhood where looking back, you can say, ah, that was, his narcissism was di well on display when X, Y, Z happened? Well, sure. I mean, the, the react, he was very good about who he would rage in front of. So mm -hmm. that was reserved for behind closed doors for the most part. He always had kind of an arrogant, haughty, um, an even offensive attitude towards other people. I mean, you, you knew that he thought um, most other people were beneath him, but uh, you know, we endured, the family endured, um, extreme narcissistic rages and so when he would rage um you know at that point I knew something was wrong but I again I didn't know what it was mm -hmm. when you were a child how did you feel when you were around this uh well I mean you know I was always on pins and needles because I never knew which version of him was going to show up. Mm -hmm. So it kept you, it kept me in a, in a constant state of, um, uh, you know, survival mode. I was always trying to make sure if, I, if he got home and was angry, how could I please him? Um, if he was in a good mood, how can I continue to keep him in this good mood? But you never knew what was going to happen. And when he would get angry, um, and blame me for something. There was never any real rhyme or reason to when he would rage at me. So there was nothing I could identify and put the pieces of the puzzle together to say, oh yeah, this is it. So if I don't do this one thing, I won't produce that. I that is an impossible situation with a malignant narcissist because anything can um, trigger a narcissistic rage. Mm -hmm. So it left me in a state of, feeling like 
um, I was fundamentally flawed or mm. bad. Mm. There, there was nothing um, because I knew my friends' fathers didn't do this to their daughters. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it leaves you with, with feeling like, you know, if, if I were not bad, possibly he would love me. Mm. Mm. Very difficult to feel at any age, but certainly as a child during this childhood time, where was your uh, mother and did she understand the behavior that was going on? She, um, she understood something was seriously wrong after they got married. Um, but she left my father when I was one and my older sister was three. So she didn't, you know, back in those days, there weren't very much information about personality disorders, but she certainly knew something was, something was terribly wrong. That's why she left him was because of the abuse. Mm -hmm. And when she, she, she left a guy knowing that he's abusive, but what did she do with the care for you and your siblings? Well, I mean, you know, she, we lived with my mother, but we mm -hmm. still did have to go and see our father for visitation. I don't think she knew what to do. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Um, he was, he overpowered us. He also mm -hmm. financially supported us. So that when you're being financially abused in this manner, you know, you really got to walk on pins and needles because you there's always the threat that if you stand up for yourself, they're going to take them. He's going to take the money away. Mm -hmm. We we talk a lot uh, about narcissism on Med Circle, obviously. And one of the misconceptions that I think people have about the narcissism discussions on Med Circle is that we are somehow trying to convince people to leave their spouse or romantic partner who is displaying these narcissistic traits. But we try to be very clear that. Uh, our job is just to provide education and stories so that uh, the viewer can make their own decision. And the decision to stay is a decision and a decision that may not make sense to some people, but it doesn't need to make sense to some people. It only needs to make sense for the person making that decision. And there are lots of reasons why somebody would stay in an unhealthy, a seemingly unhealthy relationship um, like things for financial support or the fear of leaving, or we have children together, or I'm just going to wait until the kids turn 18 or whatever it is. And, th and there's no wrong decisions. And so I think it's a, um, a very important uh, differentiator to make because while for some people, the right decision is to leave for others, the right decision for them is to stay. Awesome. Do you think your mother made the right decision? Oh, I, you know, that's a really good question. I struggle with that one because, um, because once they were divorced, we had to have exposure to him without her there to protect us. So, and then at the same time, when we were home with her, we didn't have to be subjected to it. So that's a, you know, it's, it's one I struggle with, um, whether, whether she should have stayed to be able to be you know, try and protect us while, while we were exposed to him. You know, it's, it's going to vary on so many things. I know that there are some experts out there who say um, that advocate that people should leave these relationships. And there are others that advocate if you have children, you should not leave because mm -hmm. again, they're going to likely be exposed the way I was without any parent in the home to protect them. We hear that term narcissistic rage, but you have experienced that firsthand and you're educated on this topic. A lot of people might be experiencing something similar and not even recognize it. What did those narcissistic rages look like? Well, let me just first state that it's going to depend a little bit on what type of narcissist that um, a person is living with. So for example, my father was an overt narcissist. So his rages were explosive. They were uh, full of uh, verbal and emotional abuse, um, tons of, of blame shifting. Um, they were never were physically violent, but you certainly 
uh, certainly were scared that they could turn physically violent at any time. And they could last from few minutes to several hours to even a couple of days. So, um, you know, and when you're talking about the kind of rages that I lived through, I mean, he, it was like something had invaded his body. Mm -hmm. um, like a deranged animal had invaded his body. So it, they were terrifying. But if somebody is living with a covert narcissist, for example, their, their narcissistic rage is going to look a lot different. It might be full of the silent treatment. They may not speak to a, uh, their victim for several days. Um, it could be full of, you know, passive aggressive comments in the, in the form of, you know, um, offensive comments disguised as jokes or um, um, belittling comments. They're very well known for, for doing, you know, um, withholding love and affection. That's a, that's a big one for covert narcissists and, and a lot of overt narcissists. So it, it is going to depend on what type of narcissist you're living with. And in addition to these rages, there was also the use of money to control the family. How did that type of abuse look uh, to you and your mother growing up? Well, he, my father controlled the money exclusively. So if we needed any extra money or, or, you know, wanted to go somewhere, we had to, first and foremost, you had to ask. And there were times where he would be very, very generous and let you go and, and, you know, do whatever. And there were times when you would have to kind of beg or grovel or, um, um, you know, and another part of the, the financial abuse is it's it's more of a it's more of just a knowing when they control the money. I knew that if I didn't do what he wanted as he wanted it, that I likely was going to have the financial support taken over. And, and but what it, what was something that he would want you to do as he wanted it? Well, first for starters, to not stand up for myself when he abused me. If, if I was blamed for something that I didn't do, I didn't argue with him. I just accepted the blame and tried to get through the rage and the anger as quickly as I, as I could. So, um, you know, one of the things he used to always say to me, I think this is probably the best way I could summarize it. He would say to me, when I tell you jump, you say, how high, sir? And that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, it was that type of, of, you know, um, living in a family with a malignant narcissist is a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. There's one ruler and everybody else kind of revolves around that person continually trying to, to make them happy. But the financial abuse just wasn't giving access to it and then withholding access to it. Um, he, there were covert ways that he would manipulate us. For example, if we wanted to um, explore a new career or something like that, he would, he would be in a passive aggressive way. Well, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to, to think you could do something like that? Or what, what would make somebody want you, you know, want to hire you just very, and it would give you just completely uh, be confidence destroying. Mm -hmm. So there were ways he, it was clear to me, you know, looking back, he didn't want us to be successful. He wanted to maintain that control over us indefinitely. And if he held the money, then he held the power. Mm -hmm. Really well said. The, I'm also curious to learn about how your relationship changed with your father as you grew up. And I, and I really mean from the ages of five or six, if you were experiencing this type of abuse into teen years and then into adulthood. Well, it, it definitely got more extreme as we got older. Mm -hmm. uh, it always, the abuse that we were subjected to is going to be dependent on what we're giving to him in the form of narcissistic supply. So if I was doing something that he gained recognition from or or it it honored him in some way that was great and i might avoid being abused for a while um but it it would get as i became let's say adolescent teenage years it got worse um mm -hmm. he took a drastic turn um as as we as as i got into you know 12 13 14 mm -hmm. years old um and i'm not sure and i know that's common for a lot of 
um, children of narcissists. And I'm not sure exactly what that is. If that's, they're becoming envious of the child, if they're feeling threatened maybe, um, that the child is getting older, but um, the abuse would get, um, it would be more frequent and more intense. Mm -hmm. Did the abuse ever go into uh, anything physical? Um, no, with the exception of, of some pushing or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he liked to poke me on my chest, but, but nothing that would ever um, leave a mark. And, and I do know this is a pretty common thing. A lot, most narcissists, not all, but most don't physically abuse because mm -hmm. they know they're not going to get away with that very long. Mm -hmm. But you were certainly you were certainly scared that this could turn violent anytime. The rages he would put us through were explosive and violent. So many times after it was over, the house would be torn apart because they're slamming doors and throwing things. And, you know, it was like a tornado went through the house. Mm -hmm. Experiencing all of that in those early developmental years, how do you believe you were impacted? Oh, boy. Well, I mean, this is, you know, obviously this is traumatizing for any mm. child to go through. I think probably the, the biggest thing that, um, or the most tragic situation from being raised in this kind of environment is number one, again, I, I felt that I was fundamentally bad or fundamentally flawed. So, you know, a child doesn't have the capacity to say, okay, something's wrong with my father. There's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with my father. They internalize that and take that on personally. And then the other part of it is it skews your understanding of what love looks like. Mm. So for many of us, what will happen is we associate abuse or neglect with love. And so you have to, when you, you get older, you have to work through all of that and come to a different understanding. Yeah. And you mentioned so eloquently how you feel unvalued, you feel worthless as a child. And you see the differences between your friends looking at your classmates and saying, well, their parents or their father don't treat them this way. And instead of having the understanding of, well, that's because their father is not a narcissist and my father is, it is all about you because you're a child and that is what children do. And they believe, why am I, what is wrong with me that my father would treat me this way when nobody else is? And uh, caregivers and parents, I think getting that reminder is really important. This is, I, I asked Dr. Romani, one of our med circle doctors who speaks on narcissism a lot on med circle. And I asked her if she could only tell parents to teach their kid one thing, what would it be? And she said, without skipping a beat, empathy. It's the most important skill set or quality we can provide and showcase and model to our children. And here's a perfect example of that. My guess is from our discussion today, you don't have any or very few memories of feeling empathy from your father. And when you're growing up, that's what you want. You want to be seen and heard and feel safe and loved and not having any of those certainly has devastating effects. Many parents uh, who are narcissistic or displaying traits of narcissism will use their children kind of as pawns for lack of a better term uh, in their day-to-day -day life. You may have the child who's the golden child. They can do no wrong and everyone has to live up to their attention. You may have an invisible child who goes unnoticed and is disregarded. You may have the child that gets blamed for everything. Did you ever see your father assign some of these roles for lack of a better term uh, to your family? Absolutely. Yes, they were definitely there. He, and, and this is a really good point to make specifically for my family, but the, I was definitely the scapegoat. I think my older sister was probably the invisible child or the lost child as it's sometimes referred to. And then my two little sisters, I think, um, would go back and forth from being the golden child. Mm -hmm. And we all at certain times, you know, that, that would be the golden child. It would, it would, again, it would depend on kind of what we were giving him in the form of narcissistic supply. But for the most part, those were the roles that we played. 
However, my father tried over 17 years to have a boy and he had four girls. So to him, girls weren't, um, j just weren't as good as boys. So he, in that respect, he didn't have much regard for any of us to tell you the truth. So unfortunately, when I had my son, he was the first grandchild and the first boy and my, my son became the golden child from that day forward. Wow. Well, there's a lot more for us to discuss. Um, I will be very interested to learn about uh, your marriage to a malignant narcissist. Um, this is a, I, I guess I could call it a pattern. I'm certainly not a doctor, but uh, it's very common. If, I, if you want to see who you're going to end up dating, look at your parents, look at your attachment style, look at your childhood history. Uh, Med Circle has shown me that many, many times. And um, I'm uh, very interested for you to share that part of your story because it's going to resonate with so many people, Jill. Your story is unique, but this, there are the circumstances are unique, but the story is one of many, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you for being here. We'll have more uh, with Jill Wise in our next video. Make sure you subscribe right here to our YouTube channel. Every time you leave a comment, give a thumbs up or turn on those notifications. It helps our channel. And when you help our channel, it helps us help you. I'm Kyle Kittleson. Remember, whatever you're going through, you got this.